I would like to introduce our uh, prestigious panel here. So on the left is Mike Morgan. Mike has been, uh, I certainly know Mike, but I want to make sure I get some correct things here. Um, he's a coastal ecologist with TPWD. Uh, he conducts habitat assessments on freshwater and estuarine ha habitats on the Upper Texas Coastal Plain, and he provides recommendations. And I, that's an understatement. So Mike is one of the really great agency folks, as some of the mitigation bank folks here, I think, know uh, and can share. He really, really reviews stuff. And as a land trust working to try to help preserve these areas, we're pleased that he writes a lot of comments. And he even writes comments to us on things very often. So the issue is uh, he is our agency rep here today. I will share with you, we tried very, very hard to get both the Fort Worth uh, Corps here and the Galveston Corps. And I guess due to budget restraints, they are not here. We wish they were. I wanted to let you know that we tried and tried. My hope is that next year, um, each and every one of you who are in this room and who either are doing mitigation or would like to do mitigation, make sure you contact the colonels in those districts and beg them to send people here because we really want them to know about the very important part that land trusts play and will be playing in mitigation banks. So we thank uh, Mike for traveling up here to be with us today. And then Mark Steinbach is uh, the executive director of the Texas Land Conservancy. The other day I thought uh, he was actually an attorney, but he said he only plays one on TV. Um, but, but Mark uh, is now, we're going we're gonna to abdicate the throne to him with probably the king of mitigation banking. And so he'll talk to you in just a second about a number of their projects. And then we have Daniel Bollock, who's with us today. He's a, a certified as a professional wetland scientist through the Society of Wetland Scientists and a certified wildlife biologist through the Wildlife Society. Um, he's a 1996 graduate of Louisiana State University. He's got his bachelor's of science degree in wildlife and fisheries, as well as forest management with minors in zoology, forestry, and botany. And then Alan McReynolds is here with us. Uh, he's a former member of the Clinton administration's team of environmental advisors. He brings 20 years of real estate experience to Mitigation Strategies, LLC. Uh, during his five-year tenure as a special assistant in the office of the secretary at the U.S. Department of the Interior, he worked extensively in the creation of mitigation banks for degraded wetlands and endangered species. And then we have at uh, the tail end, last but not least, Adam Rigsby, who's the president of River Riverbank Ecosystems. Um, uh, he is the president and co-founder of Riverbank Ecosystems that's based here in Austin. Uh, it's a mitigation banking and consulting firm with two stream mitigation banks in Texas. And he's worked on mitigation banking and ecosystem restoration since 2002. Um, at this time, what I'm going to ask each panel member to do is just give a little bit of background. I'm going to start with the banks here. They have a very short time frame just to give you a little bit of background about each of their banks. So we'll start with Daniel here. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so I'm with uh, Delta Land Services, where our company is about uh, five years old. I guess we have a staff of 15. We range uh, multi, very multidisciplinary, uh, foresters, biologists, uh, GIS specialists, financiers. Um, I know we, we all tend to play attorney sometimes, too, because um, there's a lot of legal matters involved with this business. So. Uh, we currently operate four approved mitigation banks within the New Orleans and Vicksburg district, and we have several uh, pending uh, mitigation banks that are in various forms of process, uh, two of which are in Texas. We have um, a site uh, within the Galveston district in Brazoria County, and we also have a site uh, within the Fort Worth district um, in Angelina County, uh, which are would uh, those are one is uh, near final approval, uh, hopefully, and one is uh, in the draft uh, mitigation banking instrument phase. So those are two that we have in process, and we have numerous other banks throughout the uh, Vicks in Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, throughout the Vicksburg, uh, New Orleans, Fort Worth, and Galveston districts is primarily where we currently operate, but um, hoping to grow even, even beyond that. <laughs> I'm Alan McReynolds. I'm with Mitigation Strategies. Uh, I formed the company in 1998. We currently have permitted banks in Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas, 
and we are currently working within the Tulsa District, the Fort Worth District, the Vicksburg District, the New Orleans District, the Jacksonville, Florida District, the Galveston District, and the Los Angeles District to permit, permit stream and wetland mitigation banks. Um, we are very interested in looking to uh, have land trusts take a look at the permanent versus temporary impacts of linear projects, particularly pipelines, uh, that uh, are coming through Texas. Because um, <clears throat> as a conservationist uh, and a member of the Wildlife and Endangered Species Committee of the Sierra Club, I have a lot of concern about what these 400-mile pipelines uh, are getting away with, uh, with regard to their 150-foot-wide uh, easements when they clear habitat and wetlands and only are required to purchase what I consider a few number of credits for that permanent damage. Um, oil and gas development is something that we spend a lot of time thinking about in the states that we're working in, and I'd be happy to talk to y'all later about uh, some thoughts I have about how you plan for that uh, within your mitigation bank. Uh, and I'm Adam Rigsby of Riverbank Ecosystems based out of uh, Austin. Um, don't quite have the breadth of experience as these two gentlemen here. To the left, we have two banks uh, we've permitted in the last couple of years. One in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Mill Branch. It's a stream mitigation bank, one of the first in the Fort Worth district ever permitted. Uh, and then the second is Cottonwood Creek, which we're working to permit right now. And hopefully we're pretty close to that. And that's right out here um, in eastern Travis County. And that, too, is a stream mitigation bank and will be one of the first uh, handful permitted in the Fort Worth district. We also work uh, with other mitigation bankers to help them permit some of their banks, whether that be landowners, nonprofits, uh, or, or big-time uh, mitigation bank firms. Um, we specialize in some of the more complex uh, permits. For example, we have a dam removal that's being done for a compensatory mitigation bank in the Wilmington district. So that's a little bit about us. Um, I work for the Coastal Fisheries Division and Parks and Wildlife, and Parks and Wildlife is a fairly large conservation agencies, and there's a lot of different programs and a lot of different people that, that do different things. Um, uh, the private lands program that many of you uh, work with, um, they do not have a role in Parks and Wildlife in the mitigation banking. Uh, outdoor education within Parks and Wildlife, they also do not have a formal role in mitigation banking. Uh, the, the entities within Parks and Wildlife that deal with mitigation banks for the Galveston District of the Corps of Engineers is the Coastal Fisheries Division that I represent. And then for mitigation banks in the Fort Worth District of the Corps of Engineers, we have staff in the Inland Fisheries Division that, that works on that. And some mitigation banks are physically located near the boundary between the Fort Worth and Galveston districts. And in those cases where there's some of that overlap, then both the Coastal Fisheries Division and the Inland Fisheries Division work together to provide comments on these mitigation banks. And the Corps of Engineers is not here today. That's unfortunate because stream and wetland mitigation banking, this is a Corps of Engineers regulatory program. And so Parks and Wildlife's role in, in this process is to provide input, to provide comments to that process. And specifically, the kinds of comments we provide are related to habitat for fish and wildlife, uh, in this context, uh, wetland and streams. And so our role is to review documents and make recommendations that will help to improve the uh, mitigation banking agreements that will help to maintain wetland and stream functions for fish and wildlife habitat. How that translates into a land trust is, as, as part of mitigation banking agreements, um, a mitigation banker is required, again by the Corps of Engineers, to have site protection for these mitigation banks, and that almost always is in the form of conservation easement, which the land trusts typically hold or are approached to hold. 
Um, and so we will comment on the conservation easement, uh, some of the language in there, to see if the language in our view is sufficiently protecting fish and wildlife habitat. And we will also comment on long-term management plans, long-term stewardship role that the mitigation bankers are required to implement for their mitigation banks. And there is discussion about what kind of entity will assume that long-term stewardship role and land trusts are being considered by mitigation bankers for that, for that role. A particular sticking point with that is, is that should a, depending on the circumstances, everything's uh, determined on the circumstances, but depending on what those circumstances are, the liability for complying with the Corps of Engineers regulatory requirements may be encumbered on the land trust if they were to enter into an agreement to be the long-term steward after the mitigation bank is officially closed. And so this, this is an area of the mitigation banking that is still being um, figured out essentially how we're gonna move forward on this. So, but to summarize, my role is to provide comments Explain the IRT. To protect, okay. Um, okay, so my role is the Corps of Engineers through its mitigation regulations has something called an interagency review team or IRT. And the IRT is composed of members of federal and state agencies as determined by the Corps. The Corps determines who they wish to have serve on that IRT. And, um, the IRT for the Galveston District and I think the Fort Worth District, I don't think there's a big difference between the two. Um, the federal agencies are the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And also in the Galveston District, the uh, NOAA's National Marine Fishery Service. Uh, on the state level, uh, the agencies are Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, and the Texas General Land Office. So there are a variety of agencies that participate on this interagency review team. And the purpose of this interagency review team in which the core serves as the chair and the ultimate decision maker at the end of the day um, is to review mitigation bank proposals. And then once mitigation banks are approved, the IRT helps with with oversight and management with the core to help administer the terms in the mitigation banking instrument. If you were in the session this morning on conservation banking, some of this will be a little bit of repeat, but uh, my organization, the Texas Land Conservancy, got involved with mitigation banking starting in 2008 when the core and EPA instituted the rule at that time to require conservation easements. So. Uh, the first rattle out of the box that we did was the Piney Woods Mitigation Bank, which is a 19,000 acre mitigation bank on the Natchez River and it's the largest in the country. Um, since then, we now hold a total of 10 uh, mitigation bank conservation easements, uh, totaling about 26,000 acres total. Um, we act only as the conservation easement holder. We are involved, and I would suspect most land trusts are not, at all with the credit sales or on any of the transaction side. We're simply providing that regulatory requirement and holding that, that easement. Um, and like I said, we've, we've only done one project involving uh, endangered species, but most of this has been uh, centered around wetlands and stream mitigation. Okay, thank you. Um, just so we can, uh, so I can kind of gear some of the level of some of the questions and, and uh, our progression through the rest of this, I'd like to, I'm gonna be asking each of you to stand at some point. So uh, just so I can see what everyone, uh, who everyone is representing. So if you are a, uh, representing a bank in the audience, if you'll stand up, if you're working for or represent a bank. Anyone? Yeah. With Delta Land Services, one chip. So you have to keep standing, Wynn, just a second. Go ahead and keep standing. All right. And then, um, all right, land trusts who are doing mitigation now, who are presently doing mitigation with banks. Great. Okay. If, keep standing. Sorry. Want to make sure we get everybody covered. All right. Um, any attorneys representing any of these folks here? All right. 
So, Allison, stand up. The rest of you, I'm going to assume, uh, and just yell out to me if it's not, that you're new to mitigation. Is that correct? Anyone who's not new? Is everybody new to mitigation? Working on our first project. Working on your first? Great. Okay, this helps me. Thank you very much. So we've got, we've got quite a few uh, what I would call newbies to this. So we're going to start just real quickly. We won't spend a long time, but we'll start quickly with some, some kind of basic questions. And basically what I'll do, gentlemen, uh, up here on the panel on the, on the banking side, is I'm just going to ask some questions. Mike, I'm going to ask you to semi-referee if you disagree with what their answer is. <laughs> so. Um, uh, I'm, the first one is going to be pretty quick and simple. To your knowledge, do all uh, uh, mitigation banks require permanent p protection, not in the form of a deed restriction, but in a conservation easement? So what, what is your knowledge of that? As, as far as I know, and I don't know if it's actually a requirement among all banks in all districts, but everyone that we have worked on requires a conservation easement um, that's held by a, either a government agency or a nonprofit, whatever the, the state laws are regarding conservation easements, that's what's been required. Uh, in the past, I have seen things such as deed restrictions, um, and, they, and, and they've just been very, very weak. Okay. Really not enforceable. So the core, in, in the districts that I've worked in, the experience is they have moved more towards uh, on mitigation banks to having a conservation easement okay. in place. What is your experience with that? Well, as was pointed out a few minutes ago, prior to 2008, we were allowed to utilize deed restrictions or covenants. And while the core may have had a sample uh, restrictive covenant that they wanted us to file with the county clerk's office. Uh, we were not required to use conservation easements uh, and work with land trusts prior to that. So depending upon the age of the mitigation bank, when it was permitted, and certainly what district it's in, uh, it is very possible that a conservation easement was not placed on that property. Conservation easements uh, are more restrictive and more definitive and or a better uh, way to protect the resource and to manage it long term, in my opinion. Good answer. <laughs> uh, I would say that you, these guys fairly well covered it. The only thing I would add is that it does vary from district to district. Uh, U.S. Army Corps district, uh, when I say district, that's what we, we're referring to. Um, the other thing that matters, of course, is someone to hold it. So it could become a situation in the permitting process of a mitigation bank if you can't find a land trust to hold your conservation easement, the core could at that point decide a restrictive covenant is, is okay. So of course, as bankers, we need to partner with land trust in order to make that happen. Okay. Jennifer, if I may add, since he opened the door to that, um, <laughs> several years ago when we were working on a bank in uh, a state other than Texas, uh, we could not find a land trust that existed that could hold our easement that the record was requiring. So we had to form our own land trust. And while I didn't want to be the executive director of a nonprofit, I am now not only a mitigation banker, but the executive director of a nonprofit land trust. Now, for those of you who are land trusts in this room, I am very eager to meet you and work with you within Texas. But outside of Texas, we use our own land trust to hold our easement because it makes sense for us to be able to do that. But it's an odd geographic phenomenon within the United States to sometimes find yourself in a position of not being able to find a land trust to donate the conservation easement to. And, and I appreciate those comments, and I just think, uh, to be clear, in the state of Texas, there is definitely a land trust available to hold conservation easements on any banks, uh, pen, depending on what the, you know, the specifics are. I wouldn't say that everyone would take anything, obviously, um, but I'm going to let Mark uh, have some comments to this. Yeah, I mean, I, I know this is a, a phenomenon in certain, certain states that don't have it, and to reiterate what Jennifer said, I mean, we're a statewide organization. There are several statewide organizations in Texas. 
And the comment that I would then pose is, if those organizations are not willing to take it, the merits of the bank, something must be going on there. Um, so that's, that would be my two cents. Just a response to that. What we've had a problem with, and we, we were working with two land trusts that are represented in this room right now. We're working with Connemar Conservancy. Um, they're great to work with. And we're also working with uh, Will Barter Creek Conservation Alliance. They're also great to work with. So we, we found the ways to work with them on our easements. But what we produced in the Fort Worth District are basically stream mitigation banks. These are not wetland banks. So these are not squares or rectangles, if you will, from a real estate parcel geometry standpoint. These are linear ribbons of land covering floodplains, and they may go across multiple landowner tracks. So it's kind of an odd duck. Uh, and, and what we found with the land trust community was uh, initially was, okay, we've got to get our heads wrapped around this. Um, so there was some reluctance initially. But we obviously struck agreement. So I would just follow up with that, saying that um, stream mitigation banking in Texas is going to make land trusts have to think of different, in, in a different uh, mode or mentality. Uh, now, if it's mixed with wetland banks in some areas, that's appropriate. No big deal. But in other areas where there really aren't wetlands per se, there are only streams. And the mitigation program will only require stream offsets. Um, you may find yourself in a situation where you're looking at easements that don't quite look like what you're used to holding. Okay, and I'd, later on I'll, like to, uh, I'll come back to the difference between just a big chunk of wetland mitigation as opposed to streams, so we'll, we'll come back to that because I'm sure the audience is gonna have some questions on that. Um, but at this time, just a real quick answer, Mike, if you can give it to me. In your review of these mitigation banks of, of I know you can only review in the Galveston district, but are you, is the core to your knowledge requiring conservation easements and land trust holders? To answer any question about whether the core requires something, <laughs> uh, I, I always have to say I do not know. That is the core's decision, and sometimes it, it varies. But to answer your question on a practical basis, the Galveston District, the standard is a third-party conservation easement holder and certainly the agencies on the Galveston District IRT we won't support anything else we will not support a deed restriction and that that's simply that's that's how business is being run in, in the Galveston District is that realistically if a mitigation banker wishes to put their mitigation bank on the ground in the Galveston District they're going to have to find a conservation easement holder to hold that. Now, of course, if they cannot find a conservation easement holder, perhaps that's a member of the Texas Land Trust Council to hold it, then they may devise other ways in which to make this conservation easement happen. And some of those ways uh, may not be preferred. I, I think the thing that's important to remember about a conservation easement is that it needs to be third party. Uh, and typically, if it's not a third party, no one is going to enforce against themselves. I mean, if the police went away overnight, we'd all be driving 100 miles an hour out here. And I don't think we would self-report. And uh, that, that's, just, that's, that's, that's just human nature. That's just human nature. And there's no you know, reason to expect the mitigation banks would be different. So if there's not a third party entity, and everybody's, you know, you have the mitigation banking company where one arm of their business is establishing wetland and stream habitat and another arm or an LLC or an NGO or however it's structured is their conservation easement holder, then that is not truly a third party and that would be objected to. And I, I would... Uh... Uh, make a note, uh, certainly an editorial comment for those of you who are working with your own land trust or working on behalf of land trusts that are doing mitigation, is to make sure that you're, whether you're in the Fort Worth District or the Galveston District, that you're there, that you're interested, and let them know, please, whether you are accredited, you are in their accreditation pipeline, or you're waiting to hear if you're accredited. Because the issue is, is 
in the land trust community, we do feel strongly that it should be accredited land trust ultimately, and not everyone is in through the pipeline yet, but that should, it is a very, very arduous process, and I would tell anyone who's considering it, yes, you should still do it, just because it's arduous doesn't make it bad. Um, but the issue is we do have, there's a number, I can tell you, in the Houston region where there is an environmental consulting firm that buys the land, they move their various clients' mitigation to that land, and then they are holding their own easements. And that is clearly not ob third-party objective watching over these tracks. And ultimately, I think it's, a, it's going to be a truly terrible thing. Not that these people are terrible businesses or terrible people, but they're probably not going to have the same interest that private nonprofit land trusts have in the permanent protect, protection of that land. And because so much mitigation, almost all of it now, there's very, very, I would say, Mike, if you can correct me or not, that there, are le there is less and less permittee responsible mitigation, correct? That's right. That's, that's, that's not, not true. That's not necessarily, the, the jury's still out on that. Okay. Well, we're happy if that's not the case, but we hear a lot about things moving towards mitigation banks and mitigation banks only. So there's certainly a lot of mitigation going this direction. So I would just make sure of those land trusts in here, make sure you let the core in your area know that you're available, you're here, you want to do these things because really and truly, it's obviously a highly subjective opinion, um, but we think it ought to be accredited land trust or in the process of becoming accredited. Um, so um, I'm going to ask you, Micah, a little bit more. On these banking agreements, um, I had the opportunity to, to speak with, so to, to, for full disclosure, we are working with Delta Land Services, and I, I will want the other two to weigh in on this. But he shared with us that in, in Louisiana, that the core actually reviews a lot of the title work, correct? That's correct. The uh, requirement within the New Orleans right. district when you do uh, not necessarily for the f initial there's various phases to getting a, a mitigation bank approved uh, when you go into the latter part of that phase which is your mitigation banking instrument review you have to provide uh, a title report uh, from a title attorney on that property and their office of counsel will review it and if they feel that there are any, anything that's questionable or that needs to be cleaned up, um, they're going to require you to do so. Or to address that whatever's in the title is not going to adversely affect the functioning of that bank. And so can y'all just speak to that as to how much, whether it's the Fort Worth district, because can, I can certainly talk about the Galveston district in a minute. But that that is Worth, new policy in Fort Worth as well. Uh, title insurance company has to produce a title abstract report. And, and, and that's, that's great. Uh, because you hate to go through the MBI approval process and waste the IRT's time and the U.S. Army Corps' time when it comes time to record an easement, you don't have the rights to the land. So it falls apart at that point. So it makes sense to do it up front. That's right. Fort Worth District does require that. Uh, the Tulsa District is, uh, only has one permitted bank, and they're, they're, they're not as formalized in terms of what they're doing within Texas, which is just the Red River Ribbon, uh, which is their district uh, area of responsibility within Texas, but the Fort Worth District does have those requirements. And I would also uh, chime in on the question about, about Galveston. Yes, Galveston has their preferred conservation easement posted on their website. Mm -hmm. And you can download that. Yes. And has anyone besides our group read that conservation easement? Has anyone else read it? It's not nearly as strict as, mo as most of ours. <laughs> so the issue is there's it's certainly a, a template to maybe go off of, but it's not what I think most of the private nonprofit land trusts would, would go by. Um, but I do want to push a, a little bit on this title issue. So I want to share a little bit of our experience uh, of looking at mitigation banks and considering mitigation banks. And I wanted to share with you um, that it is a lot of work. And I think, and, and I'm picking on the Galveston District right now, and they're not here, but uh, they could have been. <laughs> but the issue is, it is very time-consuming to be reading all the documentation about the bank 
And one of the things that's so critical, because this is, as all easements are, in perpetuity, when you are looking at having so many activities on the track later, knowing that this company may or may not be there later, 50 years from now, but hopefully your organization is going to be there and enforcing whoever owns it later. It's really important to deal with the encumbrances. And I'm going to let Mark, if, I'm going to tap you for a few minutes to let you, to let you share kind of how you go about dealing with, with that in advance. With just title? Title and encumbrance <laughs> issues and pipelines and yeah. unlocated. And so I said this before, the, the, the Playbook on mitigation banks kind of goes out the window when you're when you're comparing these to donated easements. It's a t whole kind of whole different animal. So you don't have the IRS uh, requirements for uh, mineral subordination or mineral remoteness or 100% mineral owners um, on these properties. And so just like most properties in Texas, minerals are oftentimes separated. There's a lot of times access easements, uh, pipeline easements, other things that are existing out there um, that are basically encumbering that property ahead of time and it's kind of just needing to know and figuring out how much goes on there and we've turned down projects that just have too many encumbrances on them. The upside to that is once these projects are designated as mitigation banks, they're designated as protected wetlands and so any impact that's going to happen on them is then in themselves going to have to be mitigated. Um, and so that's kind of the, the secondary fallback if there ever was a problem or something is going to be enacted on that, it's going to come back and, and have to be mitigated on site or then have to be credits bought for it somewhere else as well. Um, in addition, on most of our mitigation banks, in addition to this, we take an additional stewardship endowment specifically for our legal defense fund above and beyond what we normally take on a donated easement that goes into a special pot just for that particular reason. So. And so that's one way of looking at it. So again, this, the Land Trust Conference is about giving you tools for you to think about and use. But for us, we have, and, and again, we're, we're semi-new to the banking, certainly not to mitigation, but the banking is still new to us. Because on all of our other previous tracks, we are trying to locate easements. So we have taken the stance that we want to make sure we locate all of them. So we know when you have telegraph lines from 1918 and those kinds of things, those are tough to nail down, but anything and everything that we can get located, we are expecting the bank to, to do this. And I think it's a part of your due diligence. And I just, Mike, so can you have a comment about how much to your knowledge does the IRT review any of the encumbrances on any bank area? Does anybody review that to your knowledge? We review what is submitted to us. And so what is submitted to us can vary greatly and that's sort of it and so we might request a title report the galveston <coughs> district for example is not requiring it as such um, we could do that um, we haven't done that i would say for example that certainly mitigation bankers that in other projects or other districts that that voluntarily or are required to submit title reports there they can certainly include those title reports to us even if we didn't necessarily request them um, and you just have to be aware of as much stuff as you possibly can be up front. And, and I would say to the land trusts out there, any topic with mitigation banks that you are, you're, you don't understand or you don't think it'll be a problem and perhaps take the position of we'll deal with that later if it comes up, it will come up. And if you don't want a headache now, it'll be 10 times as great down the road. So these things do take a lot of time and they are complicated and you just got to continue to slog through it and try to resolve as much stuff as you can. I mean, if, if something confuses you or makes you uncomfortable, that's your yellow or red flag to pay attention to that. And if you don't have the information, find someone, pay someone to get that information. Okay. When you are ready to, let's say you have an extract, whether it's stream or, or larger just wetland mitigation area, and you obviously need to have a, a conservation easement holder, how do you go about in Texas now trying to find a holder for that easement? Uh, first place to start is, you know, is locally. Um, if you're in an area where you're familiar with the area, then you, you, know, you know who to talk to. 
Um, so for example, our project here in East Travis, the first, the first group I called was Hill Country Conservancy and Frank and, and George did a great job of peppering me with about 8,000 questions, which was great. Um, but ultimately we all decided that, uh, in its, in its form at that point, uh, maybe it didn't make sense for Hill Country and it was outside of their area. I mean, quite frankly, it's in the prairies of, uh, of Travis County. Um, so then he turned us, Frank turned us on to uh, John Beal uh, at uh, uh, Will Barger Creek, which was a perfect fit. Um, John expressed some concerns about the, uh, the width of the easements. Uh, I didn't want to have the same situation I had with Hill Country, which was, you know, it was just too narrow for them. Um, and I completely understood it. But just just because I've now embarked on that story, the backdrop there is, is that, you know, we purchase development rights from private landowners so a wider easement means more of a purchase a bigger check we have to write and, and oftentimes we are so deep into these projects that wow to double my land costs that's that that can kill a project so uh what we ended up doing in this case was uh getting the landowner to uh assist us in a creative solution and we ended up tripling the width of the of the buffers um, which was great news, and, and John and, and Ann there at Will Barter Creek were, were excited, and they helped us uh, close that deal. And um, So to answer your question, you, you look locally, you find the people with the best reputation, and then as mitigation bankers, you just have to be flexible. You know, these, these land trusts are going to hold these for perpetuity, and as I've heard said a thousand times, forever is a really long time. So, you know, they need to be comfortable. Uh, and you need to have a relationship with your landowners if you're not the landowner to say, okay, guys, I told you this was going to be a complicated negotiation process and it just got more complicated. And you just have to be open and, and willing to find a good creative solution. So that's an interesting note about the fact that you were basically buying, so the purchase of development rights. So you didn't own, do not own these lands. So you're buying out the development rights and then the land trust is potentially then doing Correct. the easement. Yeah, so the way it works for us is we get an option to purchase the development rights from the landowner. So the landowner remains the landowner. And so in terms of a conservation easement, the way it looks is you have the grantor is going to be the landowner. The landowner today and the landowner 50 years from now, hopefully. And the grantee becomes the land trust, and then we become a third party. So that's an interesting, and you're doing that on stream? We're doing that on stream. So. I would just speak a little bit for the land trust community that I could see that would be a bit of a bear if you have, you know, six different grantors or seven or 18 different grantors. How are you, how are you dealing with that? Um, that's, that's a great point. Um, you know, the land trust has to be comfortable with the landowners. The landowners have to be comfortable with the easement and we deal up front. Um, when we uh, ink a deal with a landowner, that deal has the easement attached to it. So there's no, oh, wait a minute, I didn't realize I couldn't put my cattle out there, or oh, wait a minute, I didn't realize I couldn't pave it, uh -huh. or you know, subdivide it, or whatever the case may be. So what we do is, you know, it's, it, takes, it takes an attorney's uh, skill set in order to make sure these deals are ironclad. Uh, and, and one of the partners in the business is, is an attorney, Texas attorney, so that's helpful. Uh, and that's exactly what we do is we, we have an easement that um, you know we shop around to the land trust and we shop around to the landowner and they usually feel good about them. Okay, uh, you know I know what I'm getting into here. And can I ask on one, if you can give me specifics, how many different landowners you have on one stream project? The largest stream project I have right now in terms of number of landowners, it's actually my smallest stream project, is um, six different signatures will be required. So six different private landowners. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, Alan, would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, no, <clears throat> we have, the most we have on one of our stream projects in Texas is four landowners. Um, and, and as Adam was just saying, you know, it's really important to, to be up front with the landowners and the land trust and, and interview everyone and make sure that it's a good fit for everybody. And one of the things that I say early on into the negotiations with the land trust is I'm going to require you, Mr. Land Trust, Ms. Land Trust, to sign a non-compete agreement with me within this service area because I will not allow you to take the benefit of learning all about my market research 
and who I might be selling credits to and looking over my shoulder and watching me do this and then come in and work with the landowner right next to me to put in a string bank right next to me and start competing head on for me because it's a financial decision for all of us. And I'm making a donation to your endowment and to your defense fund for the privilege of having the opportunity to do business with you. So you must understand that we are all in this game together, this game being my bank. And this is my bank in the service area. So if you want to work with me, then you have to sign a non-compete agreement within this service area that until my credits are sold out, you may not enter into this service area and do your own bank, which scares a lot of land trusts away because they don't want to be restricted because they want to be able to move where the opportunities are because they're all looking for opportunities, as am I, to make money to support our overhead. Okay. But it just seems like the fair thing to do. Well, and Daniel, I know your group works more on purchasing, so you want to talk about well, that? Well, we, we do both. We, okay. we own uh, mitigation sites. It's, it's probably our preferred um, solution as far as a banker for us to own the site uh, because you do have more sense of that control over what happens on the site. But that circumstance doesn't come along all the time. And when you're in the mitigation banking business, you can find ideal sites that you can buy for mitigation, but there's no market there. You'll never sell the credits. It doesn't make financial sense to invest in that. So you have to go where the needs are. And when you go into a, a watershed, you may not be able to find property that's um, available for sale, and then your only option is to get a get an agreement with a landowner to do a mitigation bank and it's a perpetual agreement you are agreeing to something in perpetuity um, and number one you want to know something about that landowner if you're gonna you're gonna make a deal that long with them you you better get to know them and and who they are and you need to have a very trusting relationship and right up front the discussion is the easement there will be a perpetual conservation easement that's really sort of when you're doing a landowner agreement you're buying you're you're paying them to put in for them to put an easement on the property because they're going to be the ones that have to grant it and sign it um, in terms of uh, in, in it there is there is risk to that um, as far as you are when you're doing that and you're kind of you are educating people who might potentially go and try to become your competitors or, or whatnot or, or go around and shop in price and things like that when in negotiations. So it's very, uh, you can see why us purchasing is, is more optional, but it's not always the thing we can do. And in terms of, um, in terms of easements and in sizes, I've never, we've, we've done some, we're working on some stream restoration projects. Fortunately, we do own those properties and the stream can actually what we need to do can actually fit within that one property. So we're not having to deal with multiple uh, ownerships uh, on the projects that we're working on. But uh, in terms of a conservation easement, I don't think we have ever put an easement on a piece of property that the easement did not have to be larger than what we actually needed to make the mitigation bank work. Um, because the easement, it has to be practicable. Uh, it's gotta be easily definable. Uh, we want a very simple legal description on it, uh, not a lot of lines and turns. We want this thing to be, and you end up using up acreage that doesn't count towards your mitigation, whether it be uplands or roads that are not being restored, existing access roads, uh, other features that usually go under an easement that uh, if I need, if I need 120 acre mitigate, I need 120 acres restoration if that's required, I mean, in some instances, we may have a 150-acre uh, conservation easement to make that happen. Thank you. Um, at this point, what I want to do is, is start to open it up, but I want to kind of make a comment and ask, actually, of the audience for those who are working on mitigation banks now. How many of you, if I can ask, um, are working on looking at or or having a say in what the management plan of this tract is? Because one of the things, of course, with this 
this type of program for land trusts is it's so counterintuitive to what most of us have been doing, which is trying to preserve the best land that we can that's out there, that's still available to be protected, because that's a huge priority for us. So this is a very different thing where, where I think, um, I'm, I'm going to assume for all of them, that they're taking lands that really, really need a lot of restoration. So your basis of what that tract is, so I'm so interested in how we're going to ultimately be doing these baseline inventories of tracts that are going to be really changed up um, significantly. So what you really write down on that baseline is, is hopefully not going to look anything like it is in 20 years. But, the, but I, I'll, I'll let Mark start with that real briefly and then does anybody else have experience with looking at what the management plan is and weighing in on that in any shape or form? Has anybody done that in the audience? Okay, then Mark, if you'll kind of take that and, and talk how you walk, walk through that. So two interesting points if you're not aware. So when you're looking at a stream or wetland mitigation bank, you're getting credits for uplift. And so basically you're taking mediocre, low quality habitat and putting it back into high quality functioning habitat. Very few times are there credits given for strictly preservation or really high quality bottomland hardwoods that exist. If you're looking at the endangered species or conservation side, you're looking for really high quality habitat that you're permanently protecting. So those are the two differences there. And Jennifer's exactly right. The one thing, and it, it was kind of just as these things evolve and it dawns on us, is that when we're doing a baseline report, it kind of looks pretty scrubby at this point in time. And it's going to be probably a 10-year horizon, but we're actually putting language into the uh, easement in some cases and into the baseline report that says this is going to be an updated document. Uh, the first bank that we've got is 08, and we've got several in 09, and we're just now seeing seedling regeneration. We're seeing stuff that's actually gotten out of the ground. But, I mean, on a forestry standpoint, you may be on a 20-year horizon for hardwoods. So, I mean, it's just something to think about. It's probably not going to affect the current uh, people that are probably in that position, but it's going to be a, a, a piece of due diligence that has to be done at some point in time. So, yeah. And and then so with regards to long term, I'm going to open this up to the audience for either your comments or your questions. But for the long term scenarios on these banks, I'm interested to know what people are thinking about how the land trust role might change on this track. And Mike, you, you put out a real big red herring there about the fact that land trust might be responsible for, for mitigation. So um, if I can just have a show of hands for those who have mitigation banks that either they've signed or they're signing. How many of you are signing on to management of the track later? Is anyone doing that? Yes. We're not signing on as the manager. creating an agreement with the Corps as it relates to what that management plan is, funding that, and then ultimately having a third party do it. So there's that, and that's then the question, is that a land trust that's managing it, that and the long-term endowment, or another, another entity? And that depends on that particular land trust expertise as it relates to the management activity. But I think the point is the dollars are the keystone issue, uh, not the liability. So if you're taking on the management, you're limited to the dollars in that endowment and the management plan associated with that. Because otherwise, you're going to get a big mess about nobody wanting to be a long term store. Right. Yes. Yeah, I've always had questions about you know, if a uh, land trust is holding the management and endowment and they're responsible for ensuring that those funds are available for the future. <laughs> And that's what's being asked right now, at least on the wetland side, we're getting approached to say, hey, will you take on now, once the bank has completed its, its lifespan, will you take on that management? Will you take on the long-term financial assurances? And quite honestly, I've said, I don't know, because no one has provided language from what our true liability exposure is going to be from the core, from the EPA. Until that happens, we're just in a holding pattern. Um, so. and, and I think, too, on this, the different roles and responsibilities, they're, they're all over the place. I mean, if I want to mow the city park, I need two things, at least two things. I need someone to hop on the lawnmower and ride it, and then I need to have money available to put gas in the thing. Those are two different roles, and those roles can be two different entities. They could be one different entity. It just sort of depends. So going forward, it's going to be what needs to be, what needs to be done 
how is it going to be done, who is going to do it, and who's going to pay for it. And a lot of these questions right now, typically, at least in the Galveston district, the way that most of the mitigation banks are being set up is that the bank sponsor, such as the gentleman on the other side of the table, they are currently in their in their documents they are stating that they will be the long-term steward the one who rides the lawnmower okay until or unless they transfer that to somebody else and so the issue here is well who's that somebody else going to be and that and that goes back to what mark was the, saying. the other complicated thing is to use your analogy is that some people are saying i can get that lawn mowing job done for a hundred bucks and some people said I can't do it for anything less than 500 bucks and so every time a different banker is asking me that and they said I'm gonna set up my long-term stewardship fund in a quarter million and somebody said I'm gonna set it up in a million I don't know who to believe and core has not established protocols for what it costs to mow the lawn and so until that happens I as a land trust can't make a, a reasonable decision either let me I'm gonna ask starting down the end and ask each of you just a couple of quick questions if you'd answer them uh, fairly briefly and then I really do the rest one of the audience questions but can you share with us um, what are you in writing you don't have to give us all the legalese but what are you in writing say is going to be your long term your longevity for this whatever mitigation bank it is whether it's streamer or, or otherwise oh I think what's important for the land trust community in here in this room that is not uh, does not have direct experience with mitigation banks was consider considering it is to know this when the bank closes is a very important mark in easements and in uh, in the bank's life okay and what that means is it has met all of its success criteria ecologically speaking it has met all the standards set out in the mitigation banking instrument which means that the mitigation banker at that point in time no longer has to worry about stem counts diversity measures, stability of a stream channel, and the like. Okay, that, that's, that's very important. The other thing that it does is it, in a three-party easement situation, in my opinion, should extinguish the rights of the third party. So in other words, as we were writing uh, an easement for Mill Branch, which Connemara helped us with, and, and their, their attorney, John Dugdale, sitting there, and he and I went back and forth with my attorney uh, ad nauseum trying to figure this one out. Um, so what we had, the, the way we set the language up was you have a grantor, which is your landowner, your grantee, your land trust, and then you had your third party, which was us. Because we didn't want either, the, we didn't want the grantor to do something that, you know, got in the way of our mitigation strategies. So what we ended up doing was uh, we basically extinguished our rights upon bank closure. Because likewise, I don't want to get in the way of the landowner and Connemara making a decision 15 years after the bank is closed. That doesn't make sense. And, and oftentimes, you know, these instruments, these uh, conservation easements are set up so that there's so much approval that has to be earned before, you know, something happens on those, those uh, easement sites. So three-party situation. And then in the uh, actual MBI, the way that we set it up is we are the stewards of the site during the life of the mitigation bank. Come bank closure, you still have two parties. We are no longer a party, but you still have two parties. You have a landowner who still takes care of their own land. Their land just happens to have a mitigation bank site on it. And then you have a, um, a land trust that makes sure that the terms of the easement are being honored. So the landowner does all the management of the site. It, it's still their land. They still own it. They still take care of it, and they agree to do so. The land trust holds on to the endowment because they're a – uh, a nonprofit, and it's just a lot more um, legally defensible, if you will. So I'm wondering in that scenario, so let's say on one of yours that you have four landowners and one of the landowners makes an extreme violation. So they clear cut part of your forested riparian stuff that you put in. But, but basically you're, you're gone, your credits are all filled and you're moving on to the next project. So certainly the land trust, I would imagine, is gonna try to do their due diligence with that. But for the public benefit, I'm just asking, of that this was credits that went onto this tract, are y'all are y'all no longer it's liable? Just, no, we're not liable. We are not liable. 
but it's the easements are set up just like your typical land trust easement should be set up right. which is a, there's a restoration clause if you do something that's against sure. these terms you are liable for restoring it and you'll have to get permission and approval with your, a restoration plan that you propose to the land trust and the army corps in that situation because the army corps will still be part of that easement okay Dur but that's all stipulated during the life of the permit but once the permit ends its useful life or is extinguished by the Corps, which could be 7, 10, 12, 15 years, depending upon what you're able to negotiate with the Corps district, our obligation ends. And that's where the endowment is standing ready to replace the trees that the landowner might have clear cut. In, you know, that's where that comes into play. Or, or actually, I, I would, I would say, Alan, if they do something that's against the terms of the easement, then they are personally financially liable. Then the landowner is liable. Right. So correct. If it's yeah, identified as a management task and a long-term right. uh, management plan, then that's paid for by the endowment. If they do something against the terms of the easement, clear cut, reroute a stream, dam up the stream, that's in, that's from their pocket. Right. What, right. When, but if it's a, but if it's an act of God, that's negotiable with the Corps. Okay. And they say then they say that up front. So Daniel and Bill when you when you when you take it uh, I mean there's there's kind of three different steps here when you get an MBI approved up front typically uh, you don't get the first amount of credits until you have the easement in place and what we ask the easement holder to do is enforce the easement they're they're sort of and not really and I don't know if the enforce is a proper word but to monitor the easement and report on it if they're not signing on to, to be the long-term manager or the long-term steward of the bank. They may have that option, but that would be down the road. Uh, up front, we're asking them to just, we're granting the easement, and then we have to, we're responsible for making sure nothing happens. The easement holder is typically reporting on, if they come out and someone has built a barn or a shop in an area that's supposed to have planted trees on it, the easement holder, the holder is not responsible for that activity. They're responsible to report that activity. And then it's a matter of core enforcement and with the banker or the landowner about how that's to be handled or remediated. But the easement holder's not, not responsible for that activity. They're responsible to report it. Um, and Dan, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask uh, for the audience uh, to weigh in at this point for just a second on uh, any comments or questions from the audience about the long-termness of these projects? Uh, yes. In the discussion just recently, we were talking about the Corps of Engineers' involvement and the mitigation bank's involvement on the long term uh, with the property. When the, when the bank is closed, is the Corps involvement in, or are they always tied to the properties along with the the core is always involved with it when some mitigate even when it even when it closes i mean we still have uh you can't we don't really think of a mitigation project as ever really ending uh you have you have a certain degree you have to construct it first and then you have a certain period of maintenance to where you're doing activities within that bank and we as a banker are doing those activities to make sure we're meeting the success criteria and the performance standards and making sure the bank functions through various stages until uh, the final performance standard, which is usually a long-term uh, performance standard, is met. After that point, it's more theoretical that it should be more, after that point, there's no more success criteria, as is what Adam said, there's no more uh, ensuring diversity, STEM counts, or whatever, but it should be a sustainable system. However, there are going to be activities you have to keep on doing. There's going to be some invasive species control, typically, that never really ends. You, you, we, stay on we have to stay on top of that. Uh, boundaries, keeping up with boundaries, keeping up with trespass issues. All of that requires some degree of, of funding, and the core, the core is still plugged into to the project. I'd, I'd like to expand on that real quick. At a minimum, the Corps will always be involved because the Corps is a third party to the conservation easement. There's language in the conservation easement that basically says if anything goes on with this easement, the Corps is also, you know, the Corps is also involved. 
I mean, really, the, the regulation of a mitigation bank is the Corps of Engineers. And because they are a third party enforcer of the conservation easement and they're written into the document, if, if nothing else ever happens, their name and their enforcement capability remains in perpetuity because it's in the conservation easement. Yes, sir. Yes. Any other questions? Yes. When you're talking about ribbons along the stream, how much of the landowner's contiguous land do you take? What are the standards for how far back you get? Uh, that's a great question, and it's a uh, it's a moving target these days. I promise. Um, I know there's at least one IRT member. I think I see Charlotte back there who's dealing with uh, our bank here in East Travis. Um, the width around streams for the purposes of conservation easement right now is dictated by district policy, which means the Army Corps of Engineers says 50 feet from intermittent channels is adequate on both sides, so 100 feet total plus whatever the width of the channel is. That is probably not appropriate in a lot of scenarios here in Central Texas. You probably need something wider which is exactly why Will Barger Creek Conservation Alliance and, and Riverbank came up with another solution. What we have now at Cottonwood Creek, uh, depending on where you are, can be upwards of 500 feet on each side of the channel, uh, probably averages somewhere closer to about 300 feet on each side of the channel, and it's intermittent. So it really depends on where in the watershed you are, and it depends on the condition of the channel. So uh, in the case of Cottonwood <coughs> Creek, it's about halfway through its watershed and the watershed at that location is roughly seven and a half square miles so that's it's a pretty good size watershed um, but you know if you are dealing with headwaters you, you may not need 300 feet in fact you probably don't because the headwaters, headwaters uh, right where the channels start to form the, their point of origin so what you end up with there is a situation where you don't expect the channel to move much at all and I think that that's the land trust concern. What happens if that channel moves? Uh, it won't move if you're lucky in five years' time when the mitigation banker's out there doing his ecological you know, uh, studies. But 50 years from now, 100 years from now, 250 years from now, ideally, you know, uh, that easement lasts in perpetuity and that channel moves, you could be in a situation where the stream is actually outside of the easement boundaries. And um, so I think that that's really a big concern for land trusts. And so you just have to look at each site and determine what the width really needs to be. Does the flood stage have anything to do with it? The, the, the streams get out of their banks. Yes, sir. They have everything to do with it. That's right. Don't you, don't you include the floodplain flood boundaries are a great place to start. And that's exactly what we did with Cottonwood Creek. Um, and I think that, you know, in, in central Texas, you can go ahead and figure in a one square mile watershed. As soon as that watershed hits a square mile, FEMA probably has a floodplain on it. Uh, so that's a great place to start. Next, next question. Yes. I have a question. It's probably here with the Northwest Trust Review. Say you have a, a company that needs to purchase mitigation credits, and what if one of their uh, staff members sits on your board or they're a contributor to the funding of the organization? Is there any type of conflict of I have nothing but priests and school teachers on my board. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've never encountered. I'm sure there would be a conflict. Well, um, right now we don't have any mitigation bankers on our board, but I will tell you very clearly that we uh, we we've done an easement with Exxon Mobil, and so. <coughs> you know, and they were on our board. So what we do is you want to make sure you have a really strong conflict of interest policy so that any discussions, what we do is we have a pretty bulletproof one. The person's not in the room. So any kind of agenda item where there's any kind of appearance of conflict, whether they are directly related to this project or not, you boot it down to the bottom of your agenda and they leave. So their facial expressions aren't in the room. They're 
mind is not in the room, and they're not conflicted either. So that's, that's my opinion. Does any, do any other attorneys have any other suggestions about that? I mean, it's a perfect tie to accreditation standards because there's such strong language and requirements associated with that and the expectation that accredited land trusts are going to be involved as the first tier choice for this kind of thing is a perfect example of why that would be so important. All right. Any other questions? Yes, sir, and then, yes, you. Okay, um, Alan, you, you talked about uh, having uh, property owners sign a non-compete agreement. No, not the, not the landowner, the land trust. The land trust, sorry, yes, the land trust. That's right. Um, I, I'd like to understand that. In the, in the case of the little water creek, that if, if we, if my land trust held a, a easement on a uh, mitigation bank that was involved with Little Barker Creek, we would not be able to hold another easement on another mitigation property on that same creek if, what, if, you were, if your bank was involved? Let me see if I can paint a scenario I would not want to be doing business with someone who was <coughs> able to see all of my business dealings and be able to take that information and go next door and compete directly against me. Because what I'm doing is not only am I making a financial contribution to that land trust, but I'm developing a long-term relationship with them as a banker, and we need to all stay friends. And if I feel that I have to protect my financial interests and withhold information from the land trust, then we're not able to have the kind of relationship that I think that we should have. Does that make sense? But a competitor of mine would not be sitting in on meetings knowing all of our oh, business that's relationships. True. That's the difference, is that a land trust might be invited into lots of meetings where we're giving them lots of confidential information about who we, you might be selling credits to, what we know about big projects that might be coming online, that might be confidential information that I might only have discovered through paying a market research firm that no one else knows about, and to think that someone that I think is uh, double dealing uh, would make me very uncomfortable. And so I'm only talking about within the service area. So, so they may be able to go downstream or upstream, get out of the service area, and do the same thing. But they're not competing with me to sell credits to the same person or within my service area. And I just Alan, feel like that's a fair thing to ask. And I, Alan, I'm assuming you're not meaning an entire HUT code. Um, eight digit, yes. Okay, that, okay. Not, right. not yeah. six, but eight. Okay. But I, it's just, okay. you know, this doesn't, this, doesn't happen, this doesn't happen very often, but I just wanted to put that out there because as many land trusts might want to be getting into the mitigation banking business, but also hold an easement, you must understand that we as businessmen have to, we have to protect ourselves against sharing information. It's a delicate, it's a delicate dance. Right. And, and he's asking you, can he hold an easement with another bank in your service area? And I'm saying absolutely you may. Okay. okay. That, that Excellent. Easy. That's that different. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, Thank you. I'm, glad, I'm glad you clarified that. 
because right. that would not be the same thing. Yeah. And I actually want to clarify that I would I would love uh, I will tell you the Bayou Land Conservancy looked at doing our own. Uh, we w we were doing in lieu fee for many many years, and um, we were looking at at doing um, a bank, but a different type where it's contiguous nature of what we've been doing for a long time. And because we are so strapped, we've decided to not go that route. I don't think Mark has his own bank. Is there anyone, any land trust, in, at least in this room, that's doing their own bank? Well, we're getting you, in but you're with, but you're with a company, right? Right. right. And they're then they're or if I'm correct, Wes, that they are organizing the credit. So, that's correct. right. So. And I think ultimately, Lori, that's a that's a great mitigation session next time, um, because I think it's it's a very interesting scenario here, and, and I'm not sure that that wouldn't be potentially the best case scenario, Wes. And, and part of the issue is I think for land trusts working in this field and trying to work in this field, is that the long term issues here are are enormous, and and if you if all you're doing is holding the easement while there's all kinds of activity that's taking place on this track and how are you really monitoring to me and maybe someone in the audience can answer this how how often um you know would you really just do an annual survey i'm gonna put you on the spot there mark are you doing just an annual survey because i'm always worried about whether or not we shouldn't be out there every six weeks you know looking at, at stuff that's going on the success of the ecological criteria is not on us right it's on the understand court. All we have to do is enforce the terms of the easements, which don't subdivide it, don't build on it, don't graze animals, don't build a nuclear waste facility, and that can be done in an annual monitoring visit. So do you, you don't look at these particularly different from any private landowner seeking a tax break? Nope. Okay. I mean, easements, and that's what I've said before. Sorry. The easements on these, as I said before, are much more restrictive than particularly donated easements, which have many more reserved rights that you might be having to monitor for. Um, and so in terms of that, it's almost an easier monitoring. You have, you have less things to worry about because it's so, and you've got an 800 pound gorilla of the core standing there. If something really does go wrong in those short, short durations. Um, so no, I think an annual monitoring is completely sufficient. So I couldn't, my, my memory was lapsed. I couldn't think of the word. It's an umbrella bank that we were looking at trying to doing, to do. Is anyone doing an umbrella bank in the, in the audience? And you're, you're working on them with different, and are you being just, are you doing it yourself, being the umbrella bank mitigation part? I want to address something Alan brought up, that we're working in North Texas with six or eight different mitigation bankers, so on services, and who's got them we're working on? But I tell every one of them that the information they provide is just for our attorney, but Alan brings up a good point in terms of maybe the conflict of interest or concerns. Maybe we do have something in writing to indicate that proprietary Mm -hmm. often learning from writing the mitigation bank easement that we may pass on to other mitigation bankers as this is language that the court is okay with, but proprietary information must stay proprietary. And we won't get enough help that. Right. Okay. Yes. I'm on Mark's board and I'm neither a priest nor a school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know for uh, for our organization, we know all that we're doing, and I hate to tell you, Mike, we don't have uh, strong language in our easements that say the core has enforceable da da da. What we show is this is the permit number, you know, SWG zero two da 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 da. We put the permit number in there, but we don't have much more in there. Do you have more in there than that? There's always the overarching language of. The MBI, the mitigation banking instrument, is the is the ruling document that says what 
can happen on the ground in terms of the ecological services and what's going to be provided out there and the, and the easement supports that and those things should not be in conflict. Um, if we fail in our duties, then the Corps has the right, as Mike said, to step in as a third party and enforce. Um, I don't think there is a situation that they've actually got the ability, well, I'm sure they could, could. I'm not sure they would look down on us and enact any kind of regulatory uh, action on us. Huh. And I'm going to uh, ask the, the bankers one quick question here near the end. So in your best case scenario, once you're done, you've gotten all your credits, who would you like to see, uh, maybe not on the stream because you're working on private, Adam, but um, let me start with Daniel actually. Who would you like to see as the holder? Do you see your company as holding that land 25 years from now being the landowner, or do you see it going to a park system with the easement in place like a local parks department? What, what do you all, do you all envision? I mean, we sort of envision kind of both scenarios. I mean, it was, it's usually up front, we just assume that we are gonna be the long-term steward of the property. Um, if, if we are to ap appoint someone, um, usually that can't happen until the bank is successful and all, the, all, the, um, all of that maintenance is over and all of your performance standards are met. At that point, uh, we can appoint someone to be the long-term steward of it. And being a long-term steward doesn't necessarily mean that they would actually be the owner, but then they would, they would carry out the duties to ensure that the, the bank is sustain, sustainable in any management activities. Uh, but the core has to, uh, the core and the IRT have to approve whoever you appoint. They have to approve your appointment. And have you envisioned this type of steward I mean, what are you looking at? Well, it's, it's mostly in terms of, uh, I mean, I would, I would want a, a conservation-oriented group, yeah. like, a, like a land trust, to do it, unless it was, or you may need a, a land trust if, if there's a transition. Some of these times, these properties we're restoring, a lot of times we target areas that are next to Fish and Wildlife Refuge, mm -hmm. Forest Service. There may be the opportunity mm -hmm. to actually move the real estate into into that uh, into that entity, which can be a complicated process in and of itself. So, if if we were to maintain the property, then I would look for a, a land trust, and I think as would as would the core, because that is actually what is suggested in the mitigation rule for a long-term steward is an entity such as a land trust. I am so glad you asked this question, Jennifer, because I think that it's really important for uh, all of us to be thinking of this when we get together and start beginning to have a relationship and forming uh, a partnership and being collegial around the idea of joining together to get this mitigation bank permitted and what's gonna happen to the land after the Corps releases the mitigation banker from their obligations. I specifically look for tracts of land which are for sale which are adjacent to state parks, state preserves, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service refuges to acquire. Because at the end of the day, I don't want to be a land manager. I want to gift the property with the long-term maintenance endowment or an additional gift to either a land trust who wanted it, and that was part of our upfront negotiations in inviting them to be our partner in the project, or to the state preserve and interviewing the preserve manager and the state parks director up front or the refuge staff and all of us being up front about what my long-term goal is. My long-term goal is not to be a land manager but to create effective habitat and wildlife corridors which have a long-term likelihood of success and the best opportunity for the habitat, the stream, the bottom line hardwood is for, and the species, is for that to be managed by an appropriate body, which is generally either a public agency or a land trust who wants to be engaged in that. Thank you. Okay. I, I think about the only other scenario that um, 
hasn't been discussed by these two gentlemen would be um, a situation where the landowner who, who, whose family for generations has worked the land. I think it's great to keep it in the family. Um, for example, the Cottonwood Creek site we have here, it's uh, the third oldest farm in Travis County. Uh, and this has given that family a way to uh, make some money today and not have to sell their land later. I agree with that. That situation does come up because necessarily we don't always own the property. It's a, it's a landowner. There's a reason they don't want to sell it. It's they have very, have very much have ties to it. But I will say what's important to us is uh, we don't necessarily mind being a land manager. That's that's kind of why we're in this business. But we're focusing on really uh, the meat of it is how is when there's management of property, there's costs associated with that. And really our role, our, our primary, one of our, our goals we're trying to achieve is to make sure we get a proper uh, endowment in place up front or mechanism that ensures that the management uh, of that property is actually financially sustainable. So we, I have a completely different take on that. Um, and the fact is, is that because we, the way that we operate statewide and have such a broad portfolio of projects, um, I absolutely do not want to be the land manager uh, for two reasons. One, you give me that piece of property, then I've got the concept of merger happening with that conservation easement. I can't self-enforce. And two, it is really expensive to keep up with all of that. And quite honestly, most land trusts are not good land managers. They don't have the staff, the time, the resources of the locale. If you're, if you're a regional land trust, maybe it fits ideally for you and you can be on the ground once a week. Anybody that owns land know it takes way more time than a once a year monitoring to do that. It takes being on the land. So it's one of the first questions I ask my mitigation banking partners, what is their exit strategy for that property? If it's a landowner and they're acting as a consultant, that's easy. If they've bought it and they're looking for it, they've got to prove some kind of exit strategy. On early banks, they didn't have one, and so now bankers are sitting on big tracts of land that has no adjoining land, they can't build, they can't do much on it. The strategy that I've seen work best right now is whenever they're buying large chunks of land, a thousand acres, they're holding out a th hundred acres or so of uplands, keeping that out of the bank, putting the bank property under and then attaching that 100 acres or something after the fact, after the bank is ready to be closed, they can sell that as a recreational property. That landowner's got 100 acres or something to play with, build his barns, his houses, and do whatever. And then he's got 1,000 acres or so that he can use for a duck hunting lease or deer hunting or whatever he wants. Granted, he can't graze cattle on it, he can't do a lot of things, but it's still a functional piece of property at that stage. So. Yes, sir, last question. Meaning, could the core op could a bank operate on core property? Could, could the private, could the partner, as a partner with the core of engineers, as, a, as an agreement with them to help them manage, operate, and run their, their plans, could that could that uh, partner develop a weapons mitigation bank on the core property that the core owns and be tied? I'll I'll take a stab at that. I mean, yeah, I'm, my 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 knee jerk reaction is no. But that's definitely a question for the Corps of Engineers. State forests may, but the Corps of Engineers may not. That's yeah. been my experience. So last, last point real quickly. Uh, Mike, how many mitigation banks are you reviewing in the Galveston District as we speak? Um, I would say somewhere around right now those that are brand new, meaning they just came in a week or two ago, all the way to ones that are this close to being approved and selling credits. I'm going to say, I'm just guessing the number somewhere around 15. It feels like a thousand, but I think it's more <laughs> around 15. Okay. All right. So the issue is this is really a growing phenomena across the country. And, and there's obviously roles, very important roles for land trust to play. And uh, I really appreciate your attendance, and let's thank our uh, very educated panel here today. <laughs> <laughs>